Now I've really screwed myself up. Um, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> Sorry. I cut myself off again. So, we'll, we'll deal with this. The origins of, of this renewed Augustinian scholarship, return to Augustine, this new anti-Pelagianism, emphasis on Augustine's um, uh, anti-Pelagian works, all starts with this political context of the Augustinian hermits, supporting the position of the Pope and the Pope granting them privileges in return, including the granting of custody of Augustine's tomb in Pavia, and there on it goes. And it is quite an amazing position. Now, I have up here the Augustine, uh, Augustinian scholarship of theology. I'm just going to go through this quickly, return to the sources I've been talking about. Uh, Augustine theology, a primacy of grace, a primacy of love, a primacy of predestination. But all that began to hinge on how is Augustine to be interpreted, because it wasn't that the Augustinians were the only people who were following Augustine. Everyone followed Augustine, as one scholar said. Augustine was omnipresent in the Middle Ages, and he was. But for the Augustinian hermits, it was really about following in the footsteps of Augustine. Um, and that was the point, and that was the key, to be the true sons of Augustine. And Jordan Cornelber also wrote in 13, or we don't by 1350, um, um, uh, uh, sort of a handbook for the order. So the Liber Vitae Fratrum, um, that he'd been asked by the young John of Basel, uh, who was one of the outstanding Augustinian theologians of the later Middle Ages. What does it mean to be a follower of Augustine? Oh, I just you can see my dog Ricky just sticking his head in there. There we go, Ricky. He's kind of sleeping on my bed um, for the moment. Um, and Jordan answered that question in this Liber Vitae Fratrum, um, in which he says that the, the true sons of Augustine are those who are the embodiment of Augustine. He is our head, we are his members, and he is our rule and exemplar. And we follow Augustine in all we do. He's the model. He's our father, teacher, leader, and head. We are his sons. We are the embodiment of Augustine. It's that re-embodiment that is the rebirth of Augustine and the rebirth of Augustinianism that was to be so prevalent in the 14th century from 13, let's say 1322, through the end of the 14th century anyway. And then what happens? We'll talk about what happens later. Um, still part of this late medieval crisis and the reformation of the later Middle Ages. And so the question then becomes, was Luther an inheritor of this 14th century Augustinian tradition? Or had, did something come in the way to separate Luther from what had been going on in the 14th century? And I'll be arguing that something certainly did, that Luther actually was had very little to do, if anything to do, and didn't know anything about his, the traditions of his own order. But we'll get there when we get there. But in terms of what's going on in this late medieval period. We have the Augustinian hermits speaking up for Augustine, arguing that it is not good works. No one ever argued that good works got you into heaven. That was Pelagius' position. But what was re the relationship between good works for the use of one's free will and grace? Far more nuanced than often portrayed. What was the relationship between God's predestination and us. Um, we cannot not sin, according to Augustine. That was the Augustinian position. A lot of the, let's say, slogans that were attributed to Luther as being something new were there in the 14th century by the, in the Augustinian hermits. Simultaneously justified and righteous. Simul, simul justus et peccator. And if any of you are from a Lutheran background, Lutheran tradition, you probably have heard that phrase in Latin, simul justus et peccator. We are simultaneously justified and sinful. That is word for word just about with Jordan Aquinas. There are a lot of similarities. This strong Augustinian anti-Pelagian theology was being cultivated and written about and argued against their opponents by the Augustinian hermits in the 14th century. Problem was, Luther didn't know anything about that. But we'll get there when we get there. This is in the context, too, for understanding what was going on with Jordan as he's lecturing on the Gospel of Matthew and writing his 
exposition of the Lord's Prayer, which he really wasn't, but he, he did so at the request of the students. The students were listening to him. They said, you know, Brother Jordan, we love so much what you had to say about the Lord's Prayer. Would you be willing to publish that as a separate treatise? And he says, yes, I will do so. And he did so. But we'll be talking about that next lecture. And that is your reading for this week to help you understand what was going on, putting it all in context, in addition to what I've written in the introduction to my translation of it. Now, if you look at it, it's a book. But the introduction, I would hope you'd look at and read. Um, and then the English translation. Obviously, you don't have to read the Latin. Um, and the notes, only if you're interested. I mean, there are two sets of notes, one uh, to the Latin text, the other is to the, the sources and things. You're welcome, certainly, to look at them. Um, but what you're required to do is to read the translation and read through the introduction and to be able to place that in the context of this lecture. Okay, if there are any questions about any of this, please ask. I hope I've made decent time, even though this is now two going to be in three parts, and my apologies for that. At least I got the last lecture all done in one. Maybe I'll be so lucky to do the next one, the second lecture for week three, all in one, two. I'll certainly try. My apologies, but here we go. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.